Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I was talking about uh, history of refrigerants. Uh, I'll, I'll speak for five minutes and then I'll wait for uh, some, uh, you know, indication that whether Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jitendra, for the message. Uh, uh, so, you know, history of refugees starts from 1830, uh, where, you know, the Jacob Perkins first used either as refrigerant in vapor compression system, and then there were number of number of refrigerants which were used, like, you know, air, ammonia, carbon dioxide, then ammonia in a vapor compression system, sulfur dioxide, hydrocarbons, and so on and so on, till 1926, when uh, R30 was used and you know when we see all these refrigerants uh, you'll see you know these common refrigerants ammonia, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and all in 1920s were having some or other challenge. You know the challenge was uh, either they were flammable or they were not uh, you know stable enough in the system or toxic or their atmospheric boiling point was not uh, favorable. So you are going under too much vacuum or you are working in very different uh, conditions. So those were the challenges uh, which you know industry was facing till 1920s or 25s. And then you know the task was given to uh, Megley to you know who was working with GM at that point in time to come up with refrigerants which are non-flammable, non-toxic and stable in the system. And that gave rise to the fluorinated industry with R12, uh, CFC12. And you know when he was presenting about the you know the features of safety uh, features of safety and flammability of 12, he blew uh, uh, the candle with it. So uh, and then he uh, inhaled it to show that it is non-toxic and all. Everything went well, and probably it kept on going well till 1970s when ozone depletion came in and we realized that hey those stable substances uh, which were working perfectly fine in the system for years and years uh, if they come out uh, from the system they again remain there in air or have very high atmospheric life uh, because of which they get lot of environmental concern and one of the major environmental concern was ozone layer depletion. We'll, more, we'll talk more about ozone layer depletion in a while. But that gives a rise to another generation of gases which were either zero ozone depleting or uh, low ozone depleting. So in 1970s onwards, CFTs, you know, started to, you know, alternatives were found. In 89, probably a lot of alternatives came in. 90s, you know, there were HFCs also came in because now we knew uh, there is also global warming, so that's how the you know refrigerant gas industry kept transiting. And you know, if you see, there are number of, of uh, refrigerants which are there, uh, which are not from fluorinated industry, but largely globally. If you see overall volumes, it's more of fluorinated uh, industry, uh, which is uh, you know uh, mainly uh, for refrigerants. And when we talk of fluorinated uh, industry, we are talking of carbon, fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen, maybe bromine or iodine uh, sometimes. So they are classified into, you know, CFC, the CFC, and HFC. I'll talk more about them. Uh, but that's how generally the classification takes place. Uh, if you're seeing my this chart, which is refrigerant chemistry. Now in refrigerant chemistry on the right hand side, you see a triangle. Now this is very interesting triangle. You have Hydrogen on top, uh, chlorine on left, and fluorine on uh, right bottom. Now you see, if you are moving towards higher amount of uh, chlorine uh, in the molecule, you are increasing the ozone depletion or you are increasing the impact on ozone layer. And what it also does is, if you have more chlorine in the, in the molecule, that means you have uh, you are also raising the boiling point. If you go towards uh, fluorine, now in fluorine you have atmospheric life increase. Now when you have atmospheric life increase, you have higher global warming potential because uh, the molecule is calculated based on 100 year uh, in atmosphere. Uh, so if you have higher atmospheric life, you have higher global 
big potential and same way you have higher toxicity uh, as well in in uh, floor uh, if you have higher amount of fluorine now if you come towards the top which is higher hydrogen level then flammability becomes uh, very significant so as we know hydrocarbons are only hydrogen and carbon so they are highly flammable if the content of hydrogen is more uh, you tend to have more flammability and you know it's not today it's not about uh, you know whether it is flammable or non flammable today it is also important that hey even if it is flammable what are the flammable properties so we'll probably in charts we are going to talk about the flammable properties uh, you know how good or a bad or a refugent can be in terms of uh, uh, flammable properties and then you know hydrogen helps in decreasing the atmospheric life so uh, reduces the amount of global warming impact uh, molecule can have so we should have a balance of uh, fluorine and hydrogen and maybe chlorine uh, as we are moving towards next generation of gases now we talk about cfc's in cfc's as we see it's there's no hydrogen if there's no hydrogen that means uh, fluorine and chlorine so very high atmospheric life very stable but ozone depleting because of the presence of chlorine so largely cfc's have been phased out globally so there are some areas where there are some amount of cfc's which are still in use but there is no manufacturing which is taking place of cfc's for any of these applications uh, now in cfc which is chlorofluorocarbon if we add hydrogen now what we do by adding hydrogen is yes there can be mild flammability if we add more amount of hydrogen but if we are adding only slight amount of hydrogen that means uh, we are reducing uh, the atmospheric life when we are reducing the atmospheric life that means over a period of 100 year or when the molecule reaches the ozone layer it starts to deplete before that once that happens the amount of ozone depletion it can have or the ozone depletion potential it can have because of the presence of hydrogen comes down drastically just to give you an example uh, for cfc 11 ozone depletion potential is 1 and for same for 22 r22 or scfc 22 which we are currently using in india ozone depletion potential is 0 0.055 so very very small as compared to cfc's and that is because of the presence of uh, hydrogen uh, now we move on to hfc's in hfc's we have uh, hydrofluorocarbons uh, in hydrofluorocarbons uh, there is no chlorine uh, since there is no chlorine it helps uh, in having zero ODP now with zero ODP we have uh, more amount of fluorine present now with more amount of fluorine present probably we are having higher global warming so the balance of chlorine fluorine and hydrogen becomes very very important in HFCs if we have higher amount of hydrogen say for example R32 uh, then we may have mild flammability. If we have uh, other molecule like 134A, uh, if where you are seeing 4 uh, fluorine, it's non-flammable or maybe fire extinguishion. So, so amount of these, uh, you know, the fluorine and chlorine uh, and hydrogen plays a significant role uh, in the refugee chemistry. Now moving on, uh, we are on uh, the next chart which is refrigerant properties. Uh, you know, when we talk of our selection of refrigerant, um, it, you know, refrigerant selection is very, very complex because you have thermophysical properties which are contradictory to each other. You want one, you get second as negative effect. So if you are looking for boiling point, you get higher pressure. If you are looking for uh, the higher, lower pressure, then you are getting lower capacity and so on. And even if you get the thermos, uh, you know, thermodynamic properties then the stability safety environment cost availability or efficiency you know all these things come into picture so what i would say is yes refrigerant properties are important uh, but you will have to have a balance uh, of these because probably our wish list is too long for us to uh, you know get a specific single refrigerant which satisfies for everything so from thermodynamics perspective if we talk you know the very first thing is refrigeration capacity now what a refrigeration capacity is it's actually the cubic feet per minute or cfm 
of a suction vapor of refrigerant to produce one ton of refrigeration. It mainly depends on the latent heat of vaporization of refrigerant and specific volume at the suction of the compressor. So if your specific volume is higher versus lower, that gives you the refrigeration capacity and it directly affects the size and the compactness of the compressor and the system. So it becomes very, very important uh, property why we can't have like one uh, R11 or 123, uh, which is very low capacity uh, in a room air conditioner because our room air conditioner size will be too big for us uh, to accommodate. Uh, then comes the operating pressures. Now, you know, there are two operating pressures as we all know in our refrigeration air conditioning system, evaporating pressure and condensing pressure. And honestly, we work, uh, we try to find out the balance between both. So we want evaporating pressure to be higher so that we are always working in positive pressure. If we are working in negative pressure uh, and the leakage occurs, the air goes inside the system, which is very difficult to handle as compared to uh, if evaporator is in positive pressure, refrigerant leaks out. So if refrigerant leaks out, it's easy to manage as compared to if air leaks in. Um, condenser pressure, again, you know, very important. Uh, in condenser pressure, we want condenser pressure to be as uh, low as possible so that we can maintain uh, a good uh, capacity uh, and all. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just pausing. I'm just checking with Jitinder. Jitinder, I'm audible. Uh, are you getting uh, my voice and charge both? Perfect. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Jitinder. Uh, so, uh, yes. so that was about operating pressure. Now uh, we talk about uh, oil miscibility. Now, you know, in compressor, apart from some of the compressors which are now available without oil, uh, but most of the compressor use oil. Now, when compressor is using oil, we want refrigerant to take that oil and flow in the entire compressor so that we get a good lubricity, whatever type of compressor we are using. Now what happens when refrigerant takes this oil and lubricates the compressor, we want this oil to come back to the compressor. Now the miscibility of the oil should be such that when it goes to the evaporator, it should not disintegrate, it should not separate out from refrigerant. The minor amount of oil should remain there and should not separate out in evaporator and come back to compressor. So that becomes very important and that's why oils are tested for each and every application based on their viscosity grade, based upon the temperatures which they are going to encounter uh, in the system. Then comes chemical stability, you know, very, very important. We don't want to have acids in our system. We want that whatever refrigerant we are using, whatever oil we are using in the system should remain stable till the end of life of system. We don't want to touch the system uh, very often. So it should be chemically stable or inert uh, to reactions with most of the circumstances. Now in our air conditioning systems, we have, if we have moisture and we have high temperature, which is generally at the discharge of the compressor, uh, this becomes very, very important. So for some of the refugees, if the temperature is going too high, it becomes very, very critical because the refrigerant may or refrigerant or oil may start to disintegrate. Then comes uh, thermal conductivity. Now thermal conductivity is again very important. We want uh, that the refrigerant should have very good thermal conductivity when it is uh, in liquid phase. So uh, in the evaporator, in the condenser, we should have very good heat transfer uh, from the refrigerant. Then discharge temperature, you know, as I was talking about the chemical stability and thermal degradation, uh, we can say discharge temperature also plays a very important role. You know, if discharge temperature of a system is more than 100 degrees centigrade, then, you know, you need to use specific materials in compressor and all those specific materials which are working for high temperatures are generally expensive or difficult to manage. So generally, this is something which compressor manufacturer takes the ownership of checking out the discharge temperature and designing a compressor for that specific temperature 
uh, or that specific um, refugee. Uh, now, one other uh, very important property is dielectric strength or dielectric property. Now, uh, most of the uh, hermetically sealed compressors, the motor cooling is also done through refrigerant. Now, if motor cooling is also done through refrigerant, we want refrigerant to be having a high dielectric strength so that it should not allow current to pass in and if there is any small damage in the motor it should not let a, a big accident happening so we should have a high dielectric property uh, of uh, refrigerant so that was on the uh, performance properties now if we talk of uh, environmental properties you know as uh, we talked about uh, ozone you know India became party to ozone uh, Montreux protocol and India is committed to phase out all ozone depleting substances uh, CFCs already phased out in India HCFCs like 123 and 22 is under phase out schedule it's going to be phased out uh, over a period of time uh, in this uh, uh, webinar we are not going to go in detail about Montreux protocol or ozone depletion or environmental because we are going to talk in detail about this what is monitor protocol how it is impacting 22 or uh, HCFCs or even HFCs we have Kagali a, a, a amendment now where HFCs are also getting part uh, with and now you know how that's going to shape up uh, for India we are going to talk that all that stuff in uh, webinar too uh, but to give you a basic idea ozone depletion potential uh, ozone depletion potential is an ability of a ozone depleting substance to damage ozone layer in reference to CFC 11. Why CFC 11? Because when we talk of ozone depletion, the most damaging gas to ozone is CFC 11. So we take CFC 11 as reference one and then compare everything along with that. As we talked uh, earlier, for CFC, uh, at CFC 22, ozone depletion potential is 0 0.055 that means it's very low as compared to CFC 11 or CFC 12 now what happens in, C, in, in ozone depletion potential we generally consider that if molecule is there in air for 100 years then what's the ozone depletion potential so a chemical uh, or a ozone, de ozone depleting substance which disintegrate in the atmosphere earlier than 100 years it's good for that because you have lower uh, ozone depletion potential same is the case with uh, HCFC 22 similarly uh, you know when we talk of global warming we all know global warming you know the rise in temperature because of the uh, sun rays entering the earth and getting trapped uh, because of the global warming gases now when we talk of global warming the most damaging gas which is acting on global warming or greenhouse effect is carbon dioxide so for global warming, the reference taken is carbon dioxide. So whenever we talk of GWP, we talk of global warming comparison uh, with carbon dioxide. Say for example, 134E, uh, ozone depletion potential, zero, global warming potential, 1300. Now what 1300 means? That one kg of 134E is equivalent to 1300 kgs or 1300 kgs of carbon dioxide so it's it's you know very highly damaging to atmosphere in comparison to carbon dioxide the amount of uh, you know the carbon dioxide in air versus the amount of 134 in air is entirely different so we are not talking about you know how big impact globally it makes but yes from molecule to molecule perspective it has high global warming potential there are a number of protocols we will be talking more about Kyoto and Kigali amendment uh, uh, in, in our next webinar. Uh, when we talk of total equal warming impact or LCCP, you know, there are two emissions. You know, if the refrigerant is there in the system, it's not leaking out. There's no global warming, there's no ozone depletion because it's working in the closed system. There's no impact to atmosphere. <laughs> when it comes out, which is a direct leakage or direct emission, then it, it impacts on global warming. Now imagine in a system where it is still there, the refrigerant gas is still there in the system, but this system is still using power. 
when it is still using power it is still impacting on global warming because of the uh, power produced using fossil fuels or uh, other emissive sources so if that is the case if we combine both the direct impact because of the emission of refrigerant and indirect impact, uh, impact which is because of the power consumption or because of the carbon emission uh, during the power which is consumed by this unit uh, we call it as total equivalent warming impact tewi now there is a small problem in tewi tewi talks about the system when the system is in place now imagine if you need to make two system one consumes huge amount of energy and second one consumes less amount of energy to produce and then at the end of life for one you need to have huge amount of rework required versus the second. So if we take from cradle to grave, which is from bringing system, refrigerant, everything to life, and then at the end of life, if we take the complete uh, you know, climate performance, that's called as life cycle climate performance. So life cycle climate performance is direct plus indirect plus life cycle so you know the cradle when the you brought the system to life and then at the end of life so both taken care of then uh, we call it as lccp lccp is now being uh, evaluated for almost all refrigerants before finalizing them as uh, good or bad from environmental properties so yes gwp is considered talked about but main thing is lccp life cycle climate performance uh, as compared to uh, standalone GWP. Uh, moving on to safety. Uh, on safety, you know, there are two things. You know, the first one uh, is flammability. Uh, what you see on this chart, uh, there are different colors. So red, uh, which is three, which is A or B, uh, three means highly flammable. And then, in green or yellow, what you see at the bottom is uh, practically non-flammable. So when we say practically non-flammable, we are saying that in the conditions which are encountered in the system uh, with, with the worst case scenarios of leakages and everything, it will remain non-flammable. So then it is considered as uh, practically non-flammable. In between, there is A2, which is flammable. And then there is another line 2L, which is mildly flammable. Now, this vertical, what you see is 1, 2L, 2, and 3. This gives you a uh, flammability classification. We'll talk more about uh, flammability classification uh, in, in subsequent slide. Uh, what is another thing which is more important here is toxicity. What you see is A and B. Now, for toxicity, the consideration is generally that if 400 ppm of substance is there in air and we are working on, uh, you know, 40, 40 hours a week or so, then there is no adverse impact. Uh, if there is no adverse impact, it is classified as low toxicity. If there is uh, adverse impact, then it is considered as higher toxicity. So, different refrigerants are classified in different categories. Say, for example, propane and butane are A3, which is highly flammable. Uh, ammonia is B2, which is uh, mildly flammable, also uh, flammable, also uh, toxic. Then uh, 123 is B1, which is uh, non-flammable, but considered as toxic. Say, and then 134A, which is uh, non-flammable, non-toxic, 410A. Most of the refrigerants which we deal in are in this green window, which is, uh, you know, non-flammable, non-toxic. Now, you know, why we talk these days about flammability? When we are switching refrigerants, say, for example, 134A, which is high global warming, when we are switching, uh, we are not able to find all the alternatives in A1 category. If we are not able to find in A1 category, we will be going up or we will be going right. So we may be working with B1, we may be working with A2L, or we may be working with B2L as well. So, you know, depending upon what applications, where we are, but we may end up working with uh, substances which have minor uh, flammability or minor toxicity. Uh, moving ahead, when we talk of uh, flammable properties, 
you know, in, in flammable properties, uh, there are two things, you know, one is chance of flame and second is effect of flame. Chance of flame is how easy or difficult is to have this refrigerant ignite. Fine. Now, in, in chance of flame, you have, uh, you know, two main properties. One, lower flammability limit that how much amount of refrigerant is required to be there in air, in the presence of air, when it can ignite. Now, in this chart, what you're seeing, uh, there is a refrigerant called 152A. Uh, this have a LFL of around 4. Now, what 4 means that if the 152A is less than 4% in air, it will not ignite. So, minimum you need is 4% in air. You know, second important property from LFL is UFL. That there would be also a higher limit. That if it crosses this higher limit, uh, then also it becomes uh, non-flammable because then you say that it is not having enough fuel. Uh, say for example, for 152A, if I'm not wrong, uh, 152A, the, uh, the UFL is around 16.9 or 17. So if it is uh, 17 or more percentage of 152A as compared to air, then it is not, there's no enough air or few, uh, enough air uh, for it to uh, ignite. Now, when I'm talking of ignite, then, you know, even if the substance is there in the perfect mix ratio of, say, 4% of 152A in air, then also we need an ignition source. Now, different ignition source have different ignition energy. So, for example, a static charge which we get on our nylon clothing, or uh, a, a cigarette lighter or a spark of 5 ampere fuse or something. You know, all these different, different uh, ignition sources may have different, different ignition energy. So, any substance which is working on a very minimum in ignition energy uh, is something which is bad. So, if you have higher, so in this chart what you see, there is 1234 YF which is on the top. Now this top means it is around, you know, 8000 or something is what you require as minimum ignition energy <coughs> for 1234 YF to ignite. As compared to propane, which can ignite, propane or most of the refrigerants which are mentioned here can ignite in less than one uh, millijoule. So very small to very high. And then again, from LFL, you see the lower amount of uh, uh, the ratio, which is two or less than two, is something that very small leakage can have a accident, is something which is low LFL. So if we are on the right hand side, it's good for us. If we are on the top hand side, we are good. If we are getting towards the uh, lower bottom, we are increasing flammability. So if we are increasing flammability in this chart means this molecule can easily ignite or are difficult to ignite. Fine. Moving on to another chart. Now this chart talks about the effect of flame. Now imagine the refrigerant, whatever refrigerant we have, have ignited. Now once it is on fire, then it will have some amount of heat of combustion. So it will generate heat. And also this heat will flow or this fire will flow. So it will have burning velocity. Now if we compare the burning velocity of different refrigerants and the heat of combustion, then we come to know that the refrigerants which have very low heat of combustion and refrigerants which have very low burning velocity are very good for us to, or not, I'll not say very good, you know, can be managed to work in the uh, systems with proper precautions taken care of. So what HRA classification does was they created this another boundary called 2L where we say that if the burning velocity is less than 10 centimeter per second, then refrigerant is considered to be as mildly flammable and where the flammability risk can be managed. Fine. Now, here there are three dots which you are seeing in 
uh, A2L. In A2L, uh, it's 32, 1234YF and 134A. Now you may be thinking, hey, 134A is non-flammable. Why it is appearing on this chart? It is appearing on this chart because 134A, despite being non-flammable, it still had has heat of combustion. So there will be zero burning velocity. It will not flow. But if you burn, it will create heat or generate heat. So we need to consider all those circumstances. And I don't know if you all know or not, all refrigerants, including 22 and all, can ignite if they are in oxygen enriched environment. And that's why, uh, you know, we are always suggest, we always suggest to do pressure test of system never with air or oxygen, only with nitrogen. So that's the reason because uh, all these refrigerants can ignite uh, in, in, in presence of uh, uh, air or oxygen. Moving on to next chart, uh, you know, in this chart, uh, it's very similar to the earlier graphs which we saw. Now in this, these are the numbers. So I'll not spend much time here. I'll say that, you know, uh, when a designer is designing a system, with mildly flammable refrigerant, he calculates, he or she works on LFL. So with LFL, you are able to find out that how much refrigerant, if it is there in this system, which can leak out to an, a particular area, which is uh, using that for air conditioning or refrigeration, then it should not have uh, combustion or the flammability. So that gives designer uh, a comfort for charge limit with LFL. Uh, with minimum ignition energy, uh, uh, they generally calculate that uh, whatever is the ignition source available while designing the system is high enough. So if there is a minor uh, spark which can ignite a refrigerant versus a very high amount, so what type of thermostat they should be using, whether it need to be completely flame proof or something or what ignition energy it can have is something which is calculated based on minimum ignition energy. And then is other consequences like heat of combustion and burning velocity. You know, these are something which are not, you know, uh, for us to design. It is just for us to know that if there are high consequences, then we are not going to use them at all. So if the burning velocity is very high, it's going to be very difficult for us to use because um, with the, even with this small amount, it can have an explosion. Now, um, moving on uh, from flammability uh, to blends. Now, you know, you saw in the earlier chart, sorry, I go back to the last chart. You are seeing this refrigerant called R32. R32 is a very good refrigerant replacement of 22. And this is something not new. It is known for ages. Ammonia. Ammonia is also very good refrigerant. B2L, mildly uh, toxic, mildly flammable, used in industry from ages. Uh, 1234YF and some more HFOs, hydrofluoroolefins, are there which are uh, there as new refrigerants which are used either standalone or as blend. Now if we talk of 32, 32 is being used as a standalone refrigerant and it is also used as one of the key blend component for almost all substitutes to replace either 22 or uh, one, three, uh, 22 or 410A. Why it is used is because it has mild flammable properties which can be easily managed uh, with uh, some others to match the desirable properties. Say for example, you know, in, in uh, case of 410A, 410A is a blend of 32 and 125. Uh, 32 being mildly flammable, 125 being non-flammable or maybe fire extinguishing. Uh, there is a mixture of 50-50 which makes 410A as non-flammable. So why blends is because we want to match properties of refrigerant to meet the specific need of an application. Now, imagine uh, we are still in those era when 22 replacements were being found. We got 32, but mildly flammable. Now, if it is mildly flammable, we added 125. So we got 410A as non-flammable, 
but now four ten a was having very high pressure as compared to twenty two. So we can't use as a drop in or a retrofit. If we can't use as a drop in or a retrofit, what we do is we add one three four a, which is a low pressure refrigerant. Once we add four one three four a and make a comfortable ratio, we get something close to four o seven c. Now in a four o seven c, you have performance very similar to twenty two. Where your pressures, capacities, everything almost matches uh, 22. Now there is a, still there is a difference between 407C and 22. In 407C, uh, you are having mineral uh, mineral oil is not acceptable in 407C. So you need to use POE oil. Now, if you want to make a retrofit refrigerant to replace uh, 22 then you need to add something which has good miscibility with uh, mineral oil so what is done is you add hydrocarbon so if you add some amount of hydrocarbon in uh, 407c or a hfc blend with very similar properties of 22 then you get a retrofit blend which are there as 422d and so many uh, blend refrigerants so what i'm telling uh, in this blends is you know you take a specific property of refrigerant you find a challenge to solve you add something so sometimes we are able to get a specific property by just adding one comp or two components or sometimes we may have to add five say for example we started with 32 moved to 410a with two then 407c with three and then with retrofit blends with almost four components so so you know th this is why blends are required because we are lacking in some or other property from a single uh, molecule moving on <laughs> now this is very very important uh, now once we see you know once we add two components it's not you know don't add this way uh by using two components and put them into a cylinder and it becomes a to b no that doesn't happen you need to have a mixing plant to ensure that the mixing ratio uh is 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 proper but in this chart what we are showing is uh you know if there was a vapor pressure of refrigerant uh, a and b as p a and p b then the normally the mix uh, ratio or the the mixture which we are getting which is a plus b should have a pressure in between a and b but it is not always the case sometimes it may be the higher one or maybe more than both individually but most likely the pressure is going to be in between the pressure of the two components and same way if it is three component it would be there in comparison to the 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 highest and the lowest uh, Uh, vapor pressure uh, component refrigerant. Uh, moving on to the fractionation. Now, what happens is now if you have uh, added two refrigerants uh, like 410A, where you have 32 and 125, the the refrigerant with the lower boiling point. Uh, you know, listen carefully here. The refrigerant with lower boiling point. will try to evaporate faster and once it evaporate faster it occupies more space in vapor so what you get when you once you pour in the liquid refrigerant for cylinder filling or in any case the the lower boiling component takes more space and occupies more space so the higher boiling component is lower now if it was a 50 50 ratio you may find that the lower component which is a lower boiling com point component which is a may be there as 80% in vapor phase uh, and higher boiling component only 20% this may happen if a and b are not you know very very miscible with each other or the boiling point difference is too high then this scenario may happen and if this scenario happens that means you cannot take 
vapor from the cylinder. If you are trying to take vapor from the cylinder, then what you are getting as a composition is 80-20, not 50-50 because there is very high amount of lower boiler in the vapor phase. So for, you know, to avoid any kind of confusion, we always say for all blend refrigerants, always take liquid from the cylinder, never take vapor from the cylinder because if you are taking vapor from the cylinder, you may have a composition shift. There are two types of cylinders available. The normal one where you need to invert the cylinder versus the dip tube cylinder where you don't need to invert the cylinder. You can take liquid uh, through dip tube. Uh, coming to the next chart, uh, which now talks about uh, the fractionation difference. Now, there can be a refrigerant with very high fractionation or high temperature glide. I'll just talk about temperature glide in a while. And um, so now there are two components uh, where both components are taken as 50-50. Uh, the pressure difference between two components or the boiling point difference between two components is not very high then what you are going to see is on the left hand side where uh, in the vapor phase uh, in the vapor uh, 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 can you see my mouse no okay so if you see uh, you know a is 55 percent and b is 45 percent so the fractionation is there but it's not adversely impacted there is still you know, a shift of 50, 50 to 55, 45. But it is not as high as what you see on the right hand side, which is 80, 20. So if you're taking 80, 20 from the right cylinder, it's going to be a disaster. If you are going to take vapor from uh, the, the left hand side cylinder, you're going to have performance issues, but it's not going to be a disaster. It's not going to have, you know, abnormally very high pressure, which you uh, you know, uh, you will easily identify you charge something else. So you have low temperature glide versus high temperature glide. Now, what is a temperature glide? Uh, I'm not sure if you have every, uh, you, have you seen boiling point apparatus? Now in boiling point, what you do is you take the liquid refrigerant, pour it into a beaker and allow it to evaporate. As it starts to evaporate, when it makes first bubble, it is called as bubble point. The temperature when it first makes the bubble. And when the complete liquid refrigerant evaporates or loses away and the last drop is vaporizing, that is called as dew point. Fine. Now the temperature difference between the bubble point when the uh, boiling started and dew point when the boiling ended the temperature difference between this is called as temperature glide. And for any system, if the temperature glide is less than three, it is okay. You know, I'm not saying that you don't need to worry about anything, but system designers can easily design a system with temperature glide of less than three versus temperature glide of more than three. Uh, you need to take special precaution while designing the system. For handling the gas, taking out or transfer and all, you still need to manage uh, both equally because, you know, if you are taking 50, 55, 45 versus 80, 20, performance differentiation can happen, but you what you want is 50, 50, not 55, 45. So you don't want penalty on the performance. So you should always take liquid uh, from the cylinder. Another important thing uh, what comes along with uh, blends is uh, the because of the um, dew point and uh, bubble point is the superheat and subcooling. Now, for a constant pressure, if you say, for example, one three four, if you look at the you know the PT table pressure temperature table of uh, one three four A, you are going to see only one uh, you know pressure versus temperature. Whereas when you look at say for example four ten A or four seven C, you will find for each and every pressure there will be a bubble point and there will be a dew point. Now it becomes important for us to know that if we are calculating the subcooling, then we need to take the bubble point, which is 100%, almost 100% liquid and the bubble starting. So we need to take for subcooling bubble point 
whereas for calculating the superheat of compressor superheat of refrigerant entering the compressor we need to see the dew point which is there on the pressure temperature table so you know generally just by looking at the pressure temperature chart we may get confused so we need to be uh, taking care of uh, both these uh, very carefully now you know some very basic things about blends and probably this is my last chart and uh, we are towards the end of the call so uh, zeotropic blend and azeotropic blend there are the difference is the fractionation so in a zeotropic blend fractionation happens in a azeotropic blend fractionation does not happen so what you were seeing as 55 45 or 80 20 will not happen it will go as and remain a 50 50 in case of zeotropic blends uh, in case of azeotropic blends sorry sorry and uh, there is a difference for you to know which refrigerant is zeotropic or azeotropic is all the refrigerants which are numbered as 400 series 410a 407c 404a all these are zeotropic blends so they fractionate all those refrigerants which do not frictionate practically all azeotropes are numbered as 500 series so 502 508b 513 all these are azeotropic uh, blends now when this fractionation happen i explained about fractionation that the lower boiling component boils faster occupies more space so it fractionate temperature glide i talked about temperature glide uh, the start of boiling end of boiling the difference between uh, those two temperatures is a temperature glide superheat subcool we talk about uh, what's the difference how to read uh, superheat and subcool for blends now how these impact is also on transfer leakage and charging so first on transfer if you're transferring gas from one big cylinder to a small cylinder you need to take care that you take only liquid from the big cylinder if you are taking vapor from the cylinder that means you may not be getting the appropriate quality the oems the manufacturers the refillers generally have their own protocol to manage these transfer but that is something which is very important to ensure if you are taking small quantity for your site charging or site stuff uh, it should be always taken from the liquid phase otherwise you may get a performance issue second thing comes is leakage you know we have detailed charts on leakage but not in this webinar uh, in leakage what happens is if there is a small leakage and the system is running now wherever there is a leakage whether it is from a vapor phase or a liquid phase if the system is running then it's not going to have any major impact on fractionation but if the system is stopped not running stationary condition and the leakage is happening from the vapor phase then you have the challenge then the entire amount of refrigerant which is there lying inside the system you don't know what is the ratio left so for all zeotropic blends which are 400 series if the leakage is there in a stationary system from the vapor side it's very difficult for you to know how much of lower boiling component leaked out versus higher boiling component so different oems different companies have different policies on top ups or entire recharge of system but this is something which is important if the system is running then whether it is leakage from vapor phase or uh, liquid phase is does not impact because the system is uh, running continuously the molecules are shifting continuously if the leakage is from a stationary system from the liquid side the impact should not be much because you are losing liquid so you're losing lot of refrigerant but you're losing uh, in the right ratio if it is from vapor side very high impact charging now for charging of the system you always need to take liquid from the cylinder if you are taking for any blend vapor from the cylinder then you are not able to get uh, what exactly uh, the ratio which was supposed to be charged so 
that is again uh, very very important so that was my last chart right on uh, 5 pm uh, if we have any question uh, i have I am not sure if I am able. I will be able to hear the question, but uh, let's let's try. And otherwise, I am reachable. I am present of Gurgaon sub chapter of Ishray or reachable at kapil at bpfkul dot com or kapil chandsingal at gmail dot com. And my mobile number is also flashing on the screen. We have two upcoming webinars uh, on uh, which is in series to this ruffian. It is the first one. Uh, the next one is on going, going to be on Montre Protocol and its implication on India. So how the phase out is happening and how it is going to happen in future for uh, HFCs and CFCs. And then uh, the next one would be on alternative refrigerants on what are different refrigerants which are coming up and how these are evaluated or compared based on Indian context of temperature working safety flammability toxicity and all that uh, stuff fine so i am uh, uh, looking forward to if there is any question Yeah, I see Sahil Arora's question on uh, 22 with uh, uh, 410A, changing refrigerant 22 with 410A, keeping the piping same, but changing the IDU and ODU, how is it possible? So, you know, uh, first of all, the pressure of 410A uh, is 1.5 times the pressure of 22. So if you are, thin, if you are keeping uh, the piping same, you need to evaluate whether the strength of piping is something which can accommodate uh, for 10A pressure or not. So it's it's very, very important. Uh, if it can accommodate the pressure of uh, for 10A, then only uh, uh, you can change the IDUs and ODUs, otherwise not. Excuse me. Hello? Yeah, I can hear it. Sir, this yes. is Subramanian. Hello? Sir, this yes. is Subramanian from Chennai. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Sir, uh, uh, 90, uh, after 2020, premium gas, uh, you know, represents it is going to be stopped, no? After 2020. Am I right? Uh, Prion no, uh, represents. No, no, it is, it is not uh, 2020. It is uh, 2025 when uh, the availability of 22, uh, which is HCFC 22, uh, may be impacted. Uh, because the phase out date is 2025 uh, and 2030 so there will be only 5 percent of uh, uh, you know the baseline so you know probably in our next webinar we are going to talk in detail about phase out because there there is a lot of complex things like you know uh, when in India does the evaluation they don't do for molecule to molecule they say that overall we will consuming this much so we can consume for this year this much for next year this much and so on so when will be the availability getting impacted for india for 22 very difficult to say but availability will be there till 2025 that's pretty sure okay thank you very much sir you're welcome why uh, why are they pacing out sir uh, because ozone Hello? depletion because of ozone, ozone depletion de potential but ammonia is, you know, most of the customers are preferring ammonia for higher application of whatever this dairy plant and other seafood industries all are using ammonia gas only. What is the reason, sir? Uh, ammonia but is I, a very, ammonia is very good refrigerant, uh, but ammonia is toxic, and the material compatibility of ammonia is also not, uh, uh, you know, with everything. So you need to have proper selection of material, and then you need to have uh, uh, ammonia considered as toxic so for a atmosphere like if you are sleeping in your room you can't use ammonia if something goes wrong refrigerant leaks out uh, you will not be able to respond whereas in an industrial environment or in a remote location like a cold store or something or a dairy plant where 
a trained technician is always there to manage the system then ammonia uh, is definitely a very good solution okay thank you much you're welcome hey ma any leakage happen in the ammonia from uh, compressor room ammonia gas right hello yes i can hear you uh, continuously for more than 2 hour 3 hours ammonia gas leakage leakage happen no what will happen to the industries any heavy damage or will so, uh, so all ammonia all ammonia systems should have uh, a leak alarms so if refrigerant leaks ammonia leaks there should be a alarm and there should be ventilation uh, switched on based on the alarm level or the concentration level that is something which is required if it is not there that system is not safe because if there is a leakage uh when you when you smell ammonia there is already too much amount of ammonia in the system uh, in the environment so even before you can smell the whatever is the concentration when you can smell you should have leakage monitoring much lower than that and that is something which is very very important to have leak monitoring uh, for ammonia system for all uh, toxic refrigerants it is uh, flammable uh, ammonia gas is uh... flammable right huh? yes flammable as well as toxic ha huh? any any more question uh, thank you very much sir sir uh, i have some other doubt which i mail to you for uh, some of the dairy plants I, I, we are supplying compressor sure sure you can uh, you can hello? drop me a mail and definitely uh, we can uh, uh, take it off thanks i will drop it and mail to you all ha huh? yeah I have sure, some technical sure. clarification. I have sent a mail to you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. You're welcome. Fine. If if there is any additional question from uh, anyone, uh, then uh, please come on, or uh, we'll conclude this call. thank you i don't see any additional question so thank you very much for joining in and uh, in future if you have any question and for future webinars we will be letting you know the dates thank you very much bye bye